before we get to my PhD thesis, which was essentially a giant book I once wrote, my public science book, Space at the Speed of Light, is now available in the US and Canada. And the link is in the description below if you'd like to buy it. This edition comes with some beautiful illustrations by the artist Justin Van Genderen. I've linked his website below so you can check out his work. Now, just so you guys know, this is the same book as Space, 10 Things You Should Know that came out last year. It's just the North American version of it. 10 Things You Should Know is also still available to purchase outside the US and Canada. And again, the link is in the description. All right, on with the video. So this is part two of a video series on the research I did for my astrophysics thesis. If you haven't seen part one yet, I'd recommend going to watch that, but let's recap it quickly here. Galaxies are islands of hundreds of billions of stars. The color of a galaxy lets us know how many stars it's forming blue and it's got lots of young hot stars that die off very quickly. If it's red then those blue stars have died off very quickly leaving behind the smaller cooler longer lived stars. Now if a galaxy doesn't have cold hydrogen gas to make new stars then it will be quenched. My PhD is all about figuring out what processes cause that quenching of star formation. I wrote a computer code called StarPy that takes the color of a galaxy and uses it to figure out the best fit model of the time and rate that star formation stops in a galaxy. In part one, I talked about my work figuring out how the shape of a galaxy affects how fast this cutoff of star formation happens, which means we now have how supermassive black holes and the environment affect galaxy star formation rate. Phew, I think we're all up to speed. So on now to chapter four of my thesis, which is the supermassive black hole chapter of my thesis. It's what I continue to work on now. So it was obviously my favorite part of my whole PhD research. It's actually split into two parts. The first half is again, looking at these rates that the star formation is dropping in galaxies, this time with growing supermassive black holes. And then the second half is actually looking at how those supermassive black holes grow. And that's what I've been doing a lot lately is following on from that work. So I'm not going to talk about that here because I'm probably going to save that for a future video to sort of just like summarize what I've been up to for the past couple of years. If people are interested in seeing that anyway, just let me know down in the comments if you want to see that. But the first half of this chapter was again using that code, StarPy, that I wrote to say, instead of for red and green and blue and spiral and blob galaxies, what about if we compare the distribution of rates that a galaxy is stopping forming its stars for galaxies that have an active supermassive black hole and galaxies that don't have an active supermassive black hole? And what do I mean by that? An active supermassive black hole is one that is currently growing. It is currently taking in material and the material is spiraling around it and slowly basically going to get eaten by the black hole to add to the black hole's mass. When that happens, the material that's around the black hole is moving incredibly, incredibly fast. It's heating up because it's moving so fast. It actually tends to glow in all across the electromagnetic spectrum from, from X-ray to radio to optical waves, we are able to see that material. So, so that's actually what the Event Horizon Telescope actually managed to get a picture of in their famous image from last year, the first ever image of a black hole, which was the supermassive black hole in the galaxy Messier 87. That's actually the material spiraling around the black hole and where you can't see anything in the middle, that's where we're no longer getting any light from because the black hole is there. Now, what theoretical astrophysicists have been saying has to happen for a very long time now is that you can actually get what's called a feedback process from feeding or growing the black hole. So that material that's spiraling around is also under intense pressures because it's moving so fast. And sometimes those pressures build and build and build until the only thing that can be done is to release some of that pressure from that material surrounding the black hole. So I like to say that the black hole essentially is a little burp kind of thing. It's not from the black hole, it's from the material around it, but you essentially get either these huge big jets forming or these sort of more like a, a soft breeze through the galaxy and what we call an outflow. And those outflows and jets can inject energy back into the galaxy. Now, if you inject energy back into the galaxy, it's gonna get absorbed by the gas in between stars that can be used to make more stars in the future. Now to make new stars, you need cold gas, which a lot of you might have just gone, what? But you need it to be really hot to have nuclear fusion. Yes, 
but you need it to be incredibly, incredibly dense to trigger nuclear fusion, which you, means you have to have had gravity collect all that gas and bring it together. And if that gas has a lot of energy, then the molecules in the gas have a lot of energy, and that means they can fly off all over the place and not care what gravity is trying to get them to clump together. But if you have a cold gas, molecules don't have that much energy, and gravity has a much better chance of bringing them together so that it gets super dense and then you can trigger nuclear fusion and make a star. So if you have a black hole that is currently growing and the material that it's growing with that's spiraling around the black hole is giving off these burps every now and then, then you're either going to heat the gas you need to make more stars or you're going to even just throw it out of the galaxy entirely. And so this is another process that we think can cause quenching, can cause a galaxy to stop forming stars. But it's just hypothesis at the minute. It comes from simulations where they try and reproduce a universe that looks identical to our own in a computer. And when they count how many massive galaxies they make, the kind of galaxies that you can't miss in the sky because they're so big, they're so bright, they make too many of them in simulations. But if they put in this process whereby you have this feedback from a growing black hole, then that stops the galaxies from growing so big and brings them back down to the kind of numbers we tend to see in the universe. That hasn't been observationally confirmed yet with real data from telescopes. And so that was what I set out to do in this chapter of my thesis. Take StarPi, run it on a sample of galaxies, I think it was just over a thousand or so of these actively growing supermassive black holes see what their colors were and see if we could see a difference in the rate that the star formation was stopping in those galaxies compared to galaxies that weren't currently growing their supermassive black holes, just like we think our Milky Way isn't. And we did see a difference. The results ended up showing that in the galaxies with growing supermassive black holes, the quenching was happening very recently and it had happened at a very, very rapid rate which is very exciting. I kind of wanted to just like shout from the rooftops in the paper that I managed to get published back in 2016 on this, that it was like observational evidence for this feedback from supermassive black holes. The problem was, is that that evidence looks promising, but it's this idea of cause and consequence. Is it actually the supermassive black hole feedback causing the quenching, this drop in star formation rate, or, is it some other mechanism, say like a merger of two galaxies that has both caused a drop in star formation and also fed a load of material to the black hole to start it growing so that we think the two things are linked when in fact they're not. And so a lot of my work now is actually focused on trying to prove which one of those two things is happening with some of the new data that we've got coming through it's not just colors, it's full spectra of galaxies. So you see how much of every single wavelength of light there is in the galaxy. And not just in like the whole galaxy, but in lots of different little sections of the galaxy all at once. But moving away from black holes now. Aww. And onto a galaxy's environment. This is what chapter five was all about, was about what surrounds a galaxy and does that affect whether the galaxy stops forming stars or not. It's this idea of nature versus nurture. The shape of a galaxy that we were talking about before is all about the galaxy's nature and what itself is like and is doing. The environment of galaxies, sort of the nurture side of things. How does what surrounds the galaxy affect how it evolves over time? So even since sort of the 70s and 80s, it's been well known that there is a lot more red elliptical galaxies in the center of very dense groups and clusters of galaxies. And there's a lot more spiral galaxies in what we call the field, i.e. the very isolated areas of the universe where there isn't that many galaxies around them. So that raises the question of whether the fact that the galaxy is in the dense environments actually can affect its star formation rate somehow. Now, those of you who saw my video from a couple of weeks back that was called Quenching 101, which is all about all the different ways that we think galaxies can stop forming stars and what processes are responsible, will remember that I talked about lots of different environment processes. 
But the most popular one that for a long time people thought was responsible is called RAM pressure stripping. So what we think happens with RAM pressure stripping is that a galaxy will fall into a very dense region, like a cluster of galaxies. And in between those galaxies in the cluster will be very, very hot gas. And as that galaxy falls in on that hot gas, it essentially feels this pressure or a wind as it falls in, which strips out the cold gas that the galaxy needs to form more stars. And you end up with these huge big tails streaming out behind it. And so we dubbed those uh, jellyfish galaxies. They're some of my favorite, favorite galaxies to talk about. They really are so spectacular. And how much of an effect this ram pressure stripping is thought to have on the galaxy is proportional to how fast the galaxy is falling in on that cluster. So I set out to determine if that was actually happening in this sample of galaxies I had that I knew to be in groups and clusters. Again, I had their colors and I ran my model on them to find you know, what rate was the quenching actually happening in these galaxies. And when I looked to see if it was correlated at all with the speed that a galaxy was infalling on a group or cluster, I found that it was pretty much flat. There was no variance there. There was no trend at all, which means that this RAM pressure stripping process probably not wasn't happening at all, because we see jellyfish galaxies, we know it's happening, but it's not the dominant mechanism in the environment like previously thought. And that really was like my main conclusion from this last chapter was that there's not just one process affecting galaxies in certain environments or of certain shapes or of certain colors. It never is. It's a mix of processes that are essentially like all working together. Like they're all in cahoots working together to make sure that somehow they stop the galaxy from forming stars and crucially also stop it from forming more in the future as well. They essentially don't just kill it, they, they keep it dead. <laughs> and that kind of leads to the idea that eventually maybe all galaxies in the universe will be red because there'll be some processes that are all working together to stop them from all forming stars. So I guess an alternative title for my thesis could have been the grass is always redder on the other side. Then the very last chapter in my thesis was the discussion and conclusion section and you'll see the main focus of this the big picture right. It was putting all of these results into context with what other people had done previously and how it fits into our big picture understanding of how the universe has evolved. You know, my tiny little contribution of things we didn't know before that we do know now. Also, I outlined how I'd improve my model, what I might have done differently next time, how I'd definitely improve it if I had access to this new type of data. Essentially, that's what I'm working on now. So it's quite nice actually going back to this discussion section and like reading it through again because it kind of acted like my to-do list for the past sort of three years and maybe for the next two as well, you know, what's gonna keep me busy. So I'm kind of glad that I went back and read my thesis. Thanks subscribers for encouraging me to do this. <laughs> After the discussion section, obviously, is just always the endless list of bibliography and references that has to come from, you know, referring to everybody else's previous work so that other people can then go and read those if they want to as well. But the very, very last page of my thesis, I wanted to do something special. So actually for the very sort of first page of my thesis, sort of for the opening, uh, I had a Lord of the Rings quote. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. After I finished my undergraduate university course, I went and worked for Rolls-Royce in their uh, graduate engineering scheme, which while it was fun, just wasn't for me. It wasn't what I wanted to do and I wasn't enjoying the work. And so I made the quite big decision to, to quit that job and apply for a PhD instead, you know? All you have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to you. So I thought that was quite appropriate. And then in my acknowledgements as well, I managed to get references into Taylor Swift, into Cheers Bar, to the Gilmore Girls, <laughs> to Bruce Springsteen. And then also because my acknowledgements were far too long by the end, the best Gilmore Girls quote ever. Oi, with the poodles already. But then as I got to the end of my thesis, I realized I didn't have a Harry Potter quote in there yet, which 
is not on in my book. So I guess I saved the best to last. I saved it for the very last page, which to be honest, I thought no one would ever notice, but it was one of the first thing my examiner said to me in, as I went into the room on the day of my uh, thesis defense was I've read every page. And I was like, yeah, you've not read every page, have you? Because you've not read all the way to the back. But he was like, nope, I've read every page. Because what I decided to end my thesis with was the very appropriate mischief managed. And that really was like my main conclusion from this last chapter. Last chapter? You know, I did think about starting my thesis with I solemnly swear that I'm up to no good as well, but I didn't think that would be the best impression to set to my examiners to say, this is the science that I'm doing in here. My thesis blue, da ba dee da ba da. It's very blue, da ba da, da ba dee da ba da.